So I'm going to start very, very basic, and then I'm going to kind of add layers of, of technique onto, onto the basic design. Um, if you've got questions, then ask them at the point you want them answered, and uh, so do interrupt me. So let me get the screen share up. You should now hopefully be able to see my SolidWorks window with the new document dialog covering most of the screen. So if you've not built anything in SolidWorks before, this is the view that, that comes up. If you have built models, then it usually gives you a version of this dialog showing you the, the kind of recent files that you'd opened. But we're going to start right from scratch. So if you haven't got this dialog up, just select um, from the file menu, select new part um, or new, and, and this will come up. So there's three primary document types in SolidWorks. There are parts, which, as it says, is a single design component. There are assemblies, which are arrangements of multiple parts. And then there are drawings, which are 2D, like engineering drawings. Um, and I would typically use those for generating um, files for taking to the laser cutter. And I thought what we would start with tonight is a very simple part to show you the basics of how to create parts. So if you select part and click OK, then you'll end up in the main design view of SolidWorks. A question there, why are you using drawings to go to the laser cutter? If you um, uh, have a perspective on a, a part, you can uh, export um, uh, uh, DWG from there, and just choose current view. That's a really useful tip, which I didn't know you could do. So thank you, Melanie. Um, I should give a bit of background. My experience with SolidWorks is as a hobby maker. So I've kind of self-taught from the tutorial materials and from various um, tutorials that I found online. Um, I do work for the parent company that owns the SolidWorks brand. So although I don't work on the SolidWorks product, I do work when I'm in an office, which hasn't been for about a year. Um, but when I'm in the office, I actually share the office with the um, Cambridge SolidWorks R&D team. So I kind of can go and pick the brains of, of experts if I need to. But I've really found the, the online tutorials to be kind of a really great resource for, for getting started and, and learning. But I'm sure there's absolutely tons I don't know. So where you know a better way of doing things than I'm doing it, um, I, I really welcome those, those interruptions. There are also very good videos, um, however, they're not free, uh, that can take you quite deep, quite quickly. OK, so a part is the, the kind of basic um, construct of a thing in SolidWorks. And there are typically two types of um, construction to start a part from. They always start with a sketch. And then it's what that's what's done with that sketch to turn it into a 3D solid object. And we're going to start. You should hopefully see a screen like I've got with a bar along the top with the, the kind of main um, the main features. Um, and we've, we've got the feature tab here selected, which gives us the kind of main um, kind of construction tools. And we're going to start with an extruded boss or base. And this is where we draw a sketch, which is a 2D drawing, and then we basically stretch it in the third dimension. So the first thing when you select new boss base is it, it needs to know what plane you want to draw your sketch on. 2D sketches are always in a plane in your 3D space. So when you're starting out, you have the main three construction planes, top, front, and right. And in this case, I'm gonna choose the top plane um, because I'm going to draw something that I would expect to kind of lie flat on the table. Um, but it, it's, it's kind of arbitrary, really, because when you build your assembly, you can rotate things and put them in any orientation. Um, uh, one thing, actually, the um, plane that engineers would start on is the front plane. That is because the front plane is the Z direction, the up and down. And uh, while that's not really important for 3D printing, it becomes important for subtractive manufacturing machining. In machining, you always want to have the uh, down view on the object from the front plane, not the top plane. That's interesting and something I didn't know. So uh, 
Um, it doesn't matter which plane you choose for the purpose of this tutorial, but, but that's a really interesting uh, a bit of knowledge. Um, so I selected one of the planes and it's immediately dropped me into a view looking down on that plane. And the only thing which exists at the moment is the origin. And we're just going to draw a simple rectangle. So you'll notice that we're now on the sketch view. It's automatically switched from features to sketch because we've got to draw a sketch at this point. And I'm going to select the corner rectangle tool. Sorry, can I ask a, a question yeah. right back at the beginning, which is that I clicked on what the the images you had at the start, part drawing, so on, and it said yeah. I had to log in, um, and it it doesn't seem to think I have. Do I have to create a SolidWorks ID before I can no, go any further? You need to. Sorry. You shouldn't need to. You don't need to create a SolidWorks ID. You should have in, uh, used your um, educational SolidWorks license number during installation. And yeah. Ask you to activate that over the internet. You I did, and on. it and it let me. Um, but when I, but it won't. Hang on a minute. So, do w did you click on part assembly or drawing? On part. Okay. Let me see. Okay, and so it's uh, it's asking me um, units. That's well, yeah. You usually for the engineering standard of the Western world, you will, uh, would want millimeters. MMGS, uh, units. Sorry, you would want MMGS units, okay? And and dimension standard BSI. Um, if you want to do for British threads and things, yes, otherwise, if you want to for, do it for European, you choose ISO, okay? Great, okay. Sorry, I, I think it's yeah, no, it's a great point, Kate. I've forgotten that the first time you ever launch SolidWorks, it asks you a few of these setup questions. Um, once you've answered them, then you don't get them again because it's now you, you set those as your default preferences. So I've, I've bypassed the whole ID thing and it's yeah. gone into the drawing that you've got, I think. Okay, so I selected the rectangle tool and I'm going to start by if I hover over the origin, you'll see a orange dot appears that will attach my sketch to the origin. So I click once and now as I move the mouse, I've, I've got a, a rectangle appearing. I'm just going to drag it out and click a second time and it completes that rectangle. And then over on the left, I can click the tick to come out of the rectangle tool. And I've now got a rectangle, but we haven't actually said how big it is. So you can see it's relative height and width, but we don't actually know what size I've drawn that at. So the next thing... Shortcut, uh, if you want to come out of every tool, hitting escape twice will do it. I usually have the left hand on the keyboard, the right hand on the mouse works beautifully. Hitting which key twice? Escape. Escape, okay. Yeah, I sometimes use escape to come out of tools. Um, but I... Hitting escape once will let you out of the selection that you made in a smart uh, dimension. Hitting it twice will get you out of smart dimension. And uh, there is a, uh, another thing that I would like to um, uh, throw in at this time. Um, if you go to uh, the settings, you can select to have uh, editable dimension boxes dragging with rectangle you can tab between the x and the y axis and enter a number there you can set it to automatically insert a smart dimension at that point right so there, there's a lot of um there's a lot of kind of helper things in solidworks and what i don't want to do right now is is kind of get people too bogged down in all the options so i'm going to go through one one workflow um, I appreciate it won't be um, it won't be perfect because I'm deliberately starting from the point of view of a complete beginner, uh, but it will get us to where we're going. And then I'd love to revisit these things, Melanie. Um, we, we can look at how we can improve and refine the sketch. Certainly. So I'm going to pick Smart Dimension, and this is a tool which will try and guess what I'm trying to measure by what I select. So if I select the line at the top of my rectangle you can see that it's guessing I want to measure the length of that line. And I just move the mouse up so that the dimension's not over the top of my um, sketch and click a second time and it drops me into the dimensions editing box. And I'm going to make my rectangle 60 millimeters wide. So I'm going to type 60. 
So now we've actually got a, a physical measurement on our rectangle. I'm going to do the same for this edge. And I'm going to make that one 80. You'll see the rectangle will resize to, to kind of match that. If your sketch isn't positioned where you want it on the screen, you can use the mouse scroll wheel to zoom in and out. Um, and I often use that to reposition because as you zoom in, it zooms in on the point you were on. So we had a view that was something like this. And what I did was I zoomed out until my rectangle was small. And then I moved the mouse to the middle of my rectangle and used the mouse wheel to zoom back in. And that kind of recenters it. Now you can either press. Sorry, the... <clears throat> could you tell me how you changed the dimensions again, where you clicked? So I was a little bit behind. So, so I clicked on smart dimension on the toolbar, which turned on that feature. You can see it's now. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. That's perfect. And then you, you can click on the things. Yeah. 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 Can I ask you at the very top of your screen, there's a bar with a series of cubes being viewed from different angles. And I'm trying to follow you and I haven't got those I haven't got uh, that. yeah so we'll, we'll come back to those in a minute I'll, I'll talk you through those and how I got them there okay um, I find it really handy to have those kind of always there okay um so to get out of smart dimension just click the green tick on the left or press the escape key and we're now back in just edit sketch mode and then we can click exit sketch or press escape again and it will drop out of this sketch back into the boss extrude you can see now that it's trying to now extrude my sketch in the third dimension. And you can either grab the arrow to kind of drag it to the height you want, or you can type a number in on the box. And I'm designing something here that would be intended to be cut out a kind of three millimeter sheet on the laser cutter. So I'm going to extrude by three millimeters. Tick the green tick. And there's my first part. And if I click back on Boss Extrude, it will highlight those dimensions. So you can see that it's three millimeters thick, <clears throat> it's 60 across, and it's 80 tall. So think of that as a piece of perspex that we're going to, uh, a piece of acrylic that we want to cut out on the laser cutter. I don't know about the settings of your SolidWorks, but in that view, when you click on the boss, you should be able to double click any of the dimensions to edit them without having to open the sketch. Yes, so if I select there and I want to change the size, I can just click on the dimension. I could change it to 15 and you'll see it will shrink the... So, We've got a, a basic part, um, but you can now see there's a lot more options have appeared on the um, on the feature bar. Um, and the next one we're going to look at is the extruded cut. Now this works similar to a boss extrude, except it removes material. And the first thing it wants to know is which plane do I want to draw my sketch on that I'm going to cut. And we now don't see the three standard planes. Instead, we've got all the surfaces of our object. So I could pick any of these edges and I'm gonna pick the top surface. Now it hasn't automatically changed the view of um, the, the angle of this. Um, there is an option to do that, I think, but you can either just rotate it using the, if I'm holding down the mouse wheel, so like the middle button on my mouse and moving the mouse around to, to kind of rotate that view. You have three options at this point. Either you can rotate it by hand, or you can go to settings and check through always normal to the sketch, or you can press the space bar now and then press the face of the cube that you like. So if I was like that and I held the space bar and I can click on a face. <clears throat> and it's... The difference is that rotating gives you an isometric view and using the space bar gives you a plan view. Yeah. Now, I often use <clears throat> these standard view settings, and these are a toolbar which I've turned on by going to View, Toolbars, Standard Views. So if you select that, then this toolbar will appear, and you can, you can rearrange these toolbars, um, but I, I parked it up there. 
And on that, I could flip between the edges, the top view, et cetera, just by clicking on one of them. And, and that for me is the way I found works, um, is, is my kind of preference. Um, but I, I like that space bar one. I hadn't actually, I knew there was a way of doing that, but I hadn't actually found out how to activate it. But you hold the space bar and then click on the face that you want to uh, make appear. So you'll notice we're now back in sketch mode, but now we're drawing a sketch on this face of our object. And we're going to draw another rectangle. I tick the green tick again or press escape to come out of rectangle drawing mode. And now I'm going to dimension it with smart dimension. And I'm going to make it three millimeters wide. And I'm going to make it 15 millimeters tall. Now, I haven't actually specified where that rectangle should be. I've drawn it, but I haven't attached it to anything. And you'll see down here, it says that I'm underdefined. My sketch doesn't have <clears throat> everything defined. And in fact, if I tick to come out of smart dimension mode, I can actually drag it around. What I can't do is make it wider, smaller. And the reason for that is that I've put these dimensions on and they've constrained it. And constraints are a really important feature of sketches. Um, we'll come back to them in a minute because I just want to finish the cut extrude and then we'll have a look at uh, kind of what constraints enable us to do. So I'm just going to click exit sketch. And we get a slightly different set of options now because we're doing a cut extrude. And I want to do through all, which means that it will cut all the material through everything in my object. And when I tick to confirm that, you can see that now we've got a hole through our piece. So we've done a boss extrude to create some material and we've done a cut extrude to cut a hole in it. And did you say that you were going to come back and define where that hole was relative to the corner of the piece it's being cut from? Yes. Okay. So if you were just doing something really quick and kind of dirty to laser cut something, you could just kind of come in. Um, don't, don't kind of copy me here. I'm just going to show you. I'm going to do a cut extrude on the top surface. I'm going to draw a triangle. Um, I'm going to make that line horizontal. I'm going to also cut all the way through. So I've made a, a triangle in my piece, but if I then decided that um, I wanted to change the dimensions. If I go back to my boss extrude and say, I'm actually going to make this only 45 wide. You can see that it's just kind of that, that triangles now sticking out the edge. That's probably not what we what we intended. Um, we probably wanted that triangle to kind of stay proportionally between the edges. And that's where the um, the the defines in the sketch, the constraints in the sketch um, actually control how it behaves when you make changes. So I'm going to go back to that cut extrude. And if I open up the little arrow next to it, you can see that the sketch appears underneath. And if I click on the sketch, then I get this toolbar and the first option in it is edit sketch. That's how you get back to make changes to an existing sketch. You can try this on your cut extrude. So you would open up the little arrow next to your cut extrude, select the sketch, and then click on edit sketch. And it takes you back into sketch edit mode so that you can kind of go and put more constraints on. I'm just going to walk you through some of the, 
the kind of value of constraints. Um, so we were talking about wanting this triangle to stay proportionally between the two sides. So what you could do, um, or what what you don't want to do in this case is use the um, dimensions. What I don't want to do is say that it's 30 millimeters from that edge because it's no, not going to then be proportionally in the middle. So instead of using a smart dimension, so I'm going to delete that dimension. There's an alternative way to apply constraints, and that is that you select the of two objects that you want to con put the constraint between. So one of the objects is going to be, in my case, the tip of my triangle, the point here. But the other object I want is halfway along this top edge. You'll find that if you hover over a line, then after a second, a dot will appear showing you the center point. So I put the mouse over the line, wait for the dot to appear, and then I can hover over that dot and select it. And now holding the control key, I can select a second dot, in this case being the one at the top of my triangle. And this toolbar appears, but the options are also available in the left hand pane. And I'm going to put a vertical constraint on. So what I'm saying is that those two points will always be vertically aligned. And you'll see that when I select that constraint, two things happen. One is that the triangle has moved across until it's directly below that midpoint. But the other is that these green squares have appeared. And these are showing me I've now got constraints on those points. A little thing to mention maybe for those people who are completely new to that. If you look at the symbol that uh, appears at the bottom right of the mouse cursor while you're hovering an object, it will tell you whether you're selecting a vertex, a line, or a surface by showing a square, a line, or a dot. Yeah, so you can see that there's a little line symbol when I'm hovered over the line, a square when I'm over a surface, and a dot when I'm over a dot. Now, if, um, an aid for aiming. If I now exit my sketch and go back to my boss extrude and change my, my width, this time if I shrink it to 50, you'll see my triangle point that I put my constraint on has stayed 50-50 between the two edges. But notice that I haven't constrained everything in my triangle, and so it's now started to distort the shape. And this is why fully defined sketches are really important, because if you haven't fully defined your sketch, it's not predictable what will happen if you make changes to other aspects of your model. So if I go back into that triangle, in fact, just before I do that, let me make the, the width the same again. If I go back into my triangle sketch, Actually, to fully define this, I need to keep adding constraints until underdefined changes to fully defined. So I probably want to say how wide the base of my triangle should be. So I can put a dimension on that. And I'll say make it 35 millimeters wide. But I also probably want this line to stay equidistant between the two edges. And I can use that same trick to come out of smart dimension mode of hovering over the line, wait for the midpoint to appear, select the midpoint, and then holding the control key, do the same for the midpoint down here, or I could instead do it to the top vertex of my triangle. So I've selected these two points, and now I'm gonna say make those vertically aligned as well. You can see it's now pulled the triangle across so that it's constrained in that dimension. So now my triangle is still not fully constrained, but if I move this dot left and right, you'll see that it's keeping the midpoint vertically below the point of the triangle at all times. But it's probably not doing what we intended in it's moving the other point to honor the other constraints, but it's not quite doing what I imagined it was going to do. And the reason is that I haven't put a constraint 
on this line to say I want it to always be horizontal. So if I select that line, just that line alone, I can put a horizontal constraint on that. And now you can see that if I drag that point, I can't now drag it side to side because I've said that these two points at the base of the triangle are 35 millimeters apart. And I've said the midpoint should always be below the middle of the triangle. So the only movement that that has left is to go up and down. And the same with this point here, I can't drag that side to side, I can only drag it up and down. So the final constraints I need to put on is something to constrain the total height of the triangle. So we can do that with a smart dimension by selecting the point and the bottom edge. And I'll say, let's make it 34. Now notice it's still not fully defined because I haven't said where in to total height the triangle is. So I can still move the triangle up and down, but I can no longer alter its shape. So I need at least one more constraint and that is to say how far from that top edge of that smart dimension in there. And let's put it 20. And you'll notice it now says fully defined. You'll also notice that everything's gone black. So when you've got a sketch that is not fully defined, it will, the parts of the sketch which are defined will go black and the parts which are still undefined or have some potential movement will stay blue. So if I go and delete, say that horizontal constraint by selecting it with a mouse and hitting the delete key, you'll see the whole triangle has gone um, blue again, except the top point that's fixed. I've constrained that top point, it can't go anywhere because it's 20 millimeters from the top and it's vertically below the midpoint. But I could now move this and you notice that it, its movement is very limited because I have to honor the other constraints, which is that it's 35 millimeters from the other bottom corner and that the midpoint stays vertically in the middle of the, the, the kind of rectangle that um, is our material. So I could put a constraint maybe on um, one of the edges. Um, there's various things you can do to constrain and they really depend on yeah, what. You could, for instance, explain the equal constraint by making the two side lines equal. Uh, yes, we could do that. So we could select this line and this line and say that they are equal, which means of equal length. And notice that's now fully defined again, because if they're equal length, this has to be horizontal because there's nowhere else with the other constraints for, for those to go. But if I took this constraint off the midpoint, then now its dimensions of movement have changed. Those lines have to stay equal length, but I've no longer said that the middle of that line has to be in the middle of my material. And so I can swing my triangle. So can I ask something really simple? Yeah. When you are moving, say you just wanted to move your triangle, regardless of constraints and everything else, are you holding something specific down on your keyboard or anything, or are you just? You uh, no, know? I'm just clicking and dragging. So what mode are you in? There, like, so you're in sketch. I'm in sketch edit mode, and I'm just dragging. You can drag things which aren't constrained. So I can't drag this black point here because that's fixed because I've right. constrained it. If I took that dimension out. Oh. Then I can now drag it by that top point as well. Hmm. Mine won't move around, but <laughs> I'm sure I'm doing something silly. So. Is it fully defined or is it still blue? Mm, it's still blue. Does that say so do you have to define it in order to um check that you're not in smart dimension mode? All right. I think, no, I don't think so. It's all right. Yeah, yeah. thanks. Carry on. Um, so that was a kind of little lesson in constraints, but we don't we don't want that triangle. So I'm just going to go back here, select that cut extrude. Now, when I go to delete it, it's going to ask me if I want to delete absorb ab, um, delete features which are kind of connected to it, because uh, notice it has its own sketch. So when I hit delete, it's asking me, do I want to get rid of 
absorbed features. And then the absorbed feature in this case would be sketch three. So if I don't tick that, I end up with a floating sketch. So the triangle sketch would remain in my object, but it wouldn't be attached to a cut extrude anymore. That's useful if you want to use the same sketch for another feature. So for example, if I don't delete that triangle, you'll see I've still got sketch three here. And what I could do is select sketch three, select boss extrude, and it would now use that sketch for a boss. So I could pull a triangle of material out of my face. But we want to get rid of it and its absorbed feature. So I'm going to tick that. And we should be back to where you are with what we were trying to draw. So we're going to go back in and we're going to put some constraints on this, um, this slot that we've cut here. So select your sketch. See the sketch has got a minus next to it. That's an indicator that it's not fully constrained. I'm then going to click Edit Sketch. And now I'm going to put some constraints on. So I'm going to say I want it to be five millimeters in from that edge. And you'll see now the two vertical lines have gone black. And now I'm going to say that I want that line to be five millimeters from that edge. Now it's fully defined, it can't move anywhere and it's defined exactly where its position is with respect to the edge. So I can come out of Smart Dimension, exit sketch, and now see the little minus has disappeared from in front of sketch two. And I've got a fully defined part. This would be a good point to save my work. So I'm going to go File, Save, I'm going to call it base plate two because I've already got a base plate. Whatever you all do, just uh, take this lesson to heart. Do save. I've lost hours of work because sometimes SolidWorks will just close. Yeah, SolidWorks does crash sometimes, and when it does, it doesn't have any kind of auto save of your work. <clears throat> You'll see when we get into assemblies that it offers to save everything that you've kind of changed through your whole project um, when you do make changes, but do remember to save it, it. It does actually nag you if you haven't saved for about 20 minutes that you've been working on a part for a long time without saving it. Well, I found out in 2020 at least, um, uh, there is a bug that can make you crash anytime you want. Um, uh, extrude a um, uh, circle within a circle, so you get a piece of tube, let's say, put a cut right in the middle of it, and then try to start a, catch, a sketch on the cut surface. Mm. Yeah. Okay, hopefully everybody's got a rectangle with a slot in it. Um, and we're now gonna look at another feature, which is how to duplicate features. We could go and draw another slot with another cut extrude, but there's an advantage to duplicating features in that if we change our mind about their size, then it will propagate to everything that was derived from that original um, feature. And that's part of the power of parametric CAD. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to, you see up here on the um, toolbar, I've got linear pattern. I'm gonna select that. Now the linear pattern is gonna duplicate features in a direction. So I have to tell it what direction. Um, so make sure direction one is selected on the left. And then I'm going to pick a face, an edge face of my part. And then I'm going to go down to features and faces, and I'm going to select the inside of my cut extrude. And you'll see that a yellow copy of itself has appeared, and it's appeared 10 millimeters away because I've got 10 millimeters in this box. But I'm going to increase that. And it's also gone outside my material. So I want to change the direction by clicking this reverse direction box next to the direction. So now it's gone 30 millimeters up my work. I actually want it a bit higher up. So I'm gonna go for 50 millimeters. Now, if I wanted three of them, I could change this to three. 
and then reduce that so that they're 20 millimeters apart, maybe 30 doesn't quite fit, put them 25 apart. And make three slots. For selecting things, um, wouldn't it be uh, about time to introduce the secondary tree? Yeah, so uh, exactly where I was about to go. When your parts get more complicated, it's sometimes difficult to select them visually. And what you can do instead is open up this tree, which is um, in your kind of work area, and you can go and select the parts there instead. So if I didn't have anything selected, I could go down my tree and select my cut extrude. And just to keep things simple, we're just going to create two of them. We'll go for 50 millimeters apart. And I'm going to click tick and you can see we've now got two holes. And I'm going to save that. Um, now time's running short, so I'm going to kind of accelerate a little bit um, just to kind of get us to assemblies. Um, I don't know, I know this session is booked for one hour, but I'm actually happy to continue to answer questions after the hour, but we should probably keep the main session to an hour, just so the recording is not excessively long. Um, so, I'm going to go and do a new part, so I've saved that part, I'm going to go in and go new part. Um, the principles should be familiar to you, I'm going to select Boss extrude. I'll pick a different plane. Um, uh, what I usually do, just um, to um, explain uh, what the other possibility, what I do is when I've done the first part, I do make assembly from part and immediately uh, hit the um, check mark, which uh, gives me an assembly with the part that I have just drawn fixed in space in the center of it with planes aligned. Yeah. Um, I as I said, there's there's lots and lots of different ways to do things, and I want to um, I want to take people through the the kind of basics just in the workflow I'm familiar with because um, it's what I've practiced. But we we can come back to to kind of better ways of doing it because um, there's a lot I'm sure to discuss in that area. Um, so I'm going to make this one 30 millimeters tall. I'm going to make it 80 long. and three wide again. And now I'm going to put another boss extrude on the edge of it. So I'm going to select the edge. And now I'm going to be sketching on this edge. And you'll notice that when I hover over the edge, it highlights the line, um, which means that it's going to automatically constrain the line to that edge. So you'll notice that there's a number of constraints that have appeared here. There's the horizontal and vertical constraints. Um, because I drew a rectangle and it automatically puts those on, but there's also these coincident constraints and they are because I started my sketch over the edge and so it's attached it to that edge. So the only dimension I need to put on here is how long I want the slot. I'm going to go for 16 and how far it is from this edge. I'm going to go for five. And that should be fully defined now because the width is constrained by the fact that it's the full width of the material. So I can exit my sketch and it's defaulting to the same three millimeters that I did my last extrude at, which is what I want in this case. So I can tick. And now I'm going to do another linear pattern. So Sorry, so that makes a protrusion on the edge of the piece. Yeah, because I did a second boss extrude, not an extruded cut. Okay. So it adds material, not removing, not, instead of removing it. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to do linear pattern, select this end edge for the feature, and I'll select it from the tree this time, my new boss extrude. I want to reverse the direction and I'm going to put it the same distance apart as my last part, which is 50. And I'm going to save that as well. Call it side piece. Now, if I go back 
if I select window, you can see the parts I've designed so far that are still open. So I can go back to my base plate too. Um, now, Melanie, you said there's a, there's a shortcut to create an assembly from the part. Do you want to just tell us what that is? Easy. You just um, uh, go to a file, create assembly from part. Make assembly, Make assembly from, part. from part. Yes. And then it gets you into where you're supposed to select the face. If you don't do that, you just hit the uh, green check mark. Which will have played anchored. Now you can go to insert components. Yeah. Okay. I'll. I'll. I'll put the other one in. Yeah. Um. So, just so that um, that may have been a bit quick for people. I'll do that again. So I had the part which I wanted to start with in my assembly open, and we went file make assembly from part, and we just ticked the tick box on the top left there. And that's started a new assembly document with that part. And you'll see it's got a little F next to it, meaning it's fixed. So my whole assembly is fully defined because this part has been fixed in place as the start of my assembly. So now we want to add our second part. So if we click insert components, it will list here all of the documents we currently have open. If the part you want to insert isn't open, then you can click browse and go and browse for it. But we've already got it open, so I can select it here. And as I bring the mouse into the work area, you can see that my part has come with it. And I'm just going to drop it in there. And you can see that it's just put it kind of sliced through my other part. And I can move it around. My assembly is now underdefined because I haven't kind of fully constrained things. So the way you constrain parts within assemblies is using what are called mates. And this is where you're essentially putting constraints between different aspects of your parts. So if I select this edge of my side plate and I select by holding the control key, this face, so I've now got two items selected and click mate. It will assume a, a mate type. And in this case, it's assumed coincident, i.e. that I want those two faces to be in the same plane as each other. Um, it's actually put my part through my other part. So I actually want to reverse the direction of that. And as you can see here, the mate alignment, there's two, um, Two options. So I just select the one that's not grey and it will toggle. So now if I click the tick, this part is now aligned with that face. So no matter how I move it, it will always line up those two faces. It's still underdefined. I can still move it around. So I need a couple more constraints. So I'm going to select this face and I want this tab to line up with the inside of the slot. So I'm going to just rotate my part around until I can see one of those faces and select that face there and click the tick. You can either click the tick on this toolbar, which appears by your mouse, which saves you moving the mouse around, or you can go up and click the tick box on the top left. So now my part is constrained in two directions because it's got two different constraints but I still need to stop it from being able to slide completely out of alignment. So I'm going to just move it to the point I can see this face here, select that, and then I'm going to rotate around and select this face here. Now you can see that things aren't lining up because I've actually picked the wrong tab to line up with my, my end point there. So I'm going to have to undo some of that. Um, because I'm still in this constraint, I can actually go and do clear selections. Um, but it's it's kind of locked it so that I can't move it. So I'm going to click the tick. Sorry, I'm going to tick the cross to come out of mates. And now if I go back to the feature, I can go back into mate. Hopefully I can move it again. Actually, what I wanted was 
that face to line up with this face here. But of course, it's picked that direction, which isn't what I wanted. So I'll flip that mate. But you can see that actually it's reversed the direction of one of my other mates to make that possible. But now I've got the wrong face in that mate, which I created to the because I picked the wrong side of my my part. So I'm going to come out of the mates mode and now I can open up the mates that I've got. So that one's good. You can see when I hover over it, it highlights the aspects. That's the one that's bad and that one's good. So it's that middle one that I want to edit. So I select that and then the edit feature um, thing appears. I can select on that and now I can go in and you can see that this side face and the base face that I picked were not quite right. So I'm going to right click and do delete to remove one of them. So now I can rotate that around and select this face. Now you can see that it's reversed the direction of mates because for what it thinks I want to do, but that clearly isn't right. So I'm going to tell it now I want to actually align the other way. And it's now got everything fully defined. So I can tick all the green ticks to come out of that. Um, and you can see that it's not actually quite lining up because I've got my measurements wrong on my two parts. And that's a whole lesson which we'll probably cover in another session. But what we can do to um, just correct that for now is if I select a part, then I get this option to open that part and it will take me back to that part in the editor and I'm not sure whether it was that I had these too far apart. Let's go and look at our other part and see which one was it that we Ah, my tabs are only 15 long. I think that's where I went wrong. Whereas when I did this one, I made it 16 long. Make that 15 long. You may have noticed both of them changed. Uh, yeah, because they're both derived from the same definition because I use linear pattern. And I'm going to go back to my assembly and it's automatically updated, you see? So now everything's lined up nicely. And if I look underneath, there's my tab sticking through. So there's a lot that we can improve about this, which I'm going to cover in the next session. Um, but for a basic how to build a part and assembly, I think we've covered all the bases there. Apart from saving my work. So I click Save. Now a dialogue's popped up saying that I've changed. Remember I made an edit to this side piece and I haven't saved that. The following reference have been modified and will be saved. So when I click save all, it'll actually save everything that I've changed that's in that assembly. And I haven't given the assembly a name yet. So it's asking me what I want to call it. And there we go. So I've now got two parts that I could use, um, that I could cut out on the laser cutter and slot together. So let's have one quick look in the last five minutes at the drawings feature. So if we go back to File New, um, I could actually do Make Drawing from Assembly, but I'm going to go through and do it the other way, which is to create a drawing manually and then decide what I want to put in it afterwards. Um, and an A3 sheet is going to be plenty big enough for this little project. Um, if you don't want all of this kind of gubbins, engineering drawing gubbins in the corner, you can just untick display sheet format and you just end up with an A3 rectangle. And now it's asking me, what do I want to view? And I'm going to start with my base plate. Um, and the way I normally do this is I go, there's a toolbar on the right, and it has this icon, which looks a bit like a drawing, 
is called the view palette. And this is where um, I can pick different views of my part. Remember, my drawing here is 2D and my part is 3D. So if I pick my base plate, you'll see that it's showing me all the possible views of it in 2D that it's kind of come up with the standard views. So I'm going to say I want the top view. And I'm going to drag that onto my sheet. Um, now, these kind of things appear automatically, which lets you tag and add multiple views if you were building a kind of engineer's drawing. But what I want to do here is just generate a top down view for laser cutting. So I'm going to ignore that. So I'm just going to tick the tick. I'm going to go back here and I'm going to select my other part. If your parts aren't appearing in the drop down list here, then you can use browse to go and find them on your disk. And I'm going to also pick the front view. And I'm going to drag that in. And then I'm going to right click. Actually, let me just click the tick. I'm going to right click on it then and rotate it. Which I think is somewhere here. Zoom pan rotate. Rotate view. And I'm going to rotate it through 90 degrees. So now I've got my two parts on a drawing. Got them reasonably close together so I don't waste material. And now I can do file, save as. Now the first um, time I'm going to do that, it's asking me, do I want to update the views before I save? I can just say yes to that. Um, and I'm going to call it Parts. So I'm saving it as a SolidWorks drawing. There's a reason for saving it in that format first. And that is that if I later make changes to my parts, this SolidWorks drawing file will automatically update. Whereas if I export it as a DXF file to take to the laser cutter, that will be disconnected from my original parts. And I'd have to kind of rebuild all of this again from scratch. So I'm not going to use that SOLIDWORKS drawing file for the laser cutter. I'm going to go back to do save as. And for the laser cutter, we've got it make space. It takes DXF files. So I'm going to choose DXF and do save DXF. And that's a file that I could probably take to the laser cutter. But I have found that sometimes the DXF files um, are slightly problematic. Um, and because we're using the student edition, they're also watermarked, um, which we don't want on our laser cutting. So I'm going to open up Inkscape, everybody's favorite free vector drawing editing program. And I'm going to open my parts DXF, which I just saved from SOLIDWORKS. I'm going to leave all of these on defaults. So you can see this is what I mean by the watermark. It's put SOLIDWORKS educational product for instructional use only. That's because the license for the student edition is for non-commercial use only. Um, and so it, it watermarks drawings. But because I'm wanting to laser cut this for my own personal use, I'm just going to select that text, get rid of it. So now I've got my part. Um, if I wanted to add text for engraving, I typically do that in Inkscape rather than in SolidWorks. So if I wanted to um, put some writing on this, I could use the tool to put my branding on it. I remember our laser cutter software at Makespace doesn't handle text as text. So before I save this, I need to do object to path to turn that from text into paths. Yeah, what that means is that that's now
a bunch of separate individual lines. Is that like a vector? Yes. So, so like, you can draw it in Inkscape and then convert it back to SolidWorks to communicate with the uh, cutter. Uh, no, so the, the cutter we have at Makespace has its own software on a computer in Makespace and you need to import a DXF file mm. from a USB drive. So what I do is I come into Inkscape. Um, if I want to, um, if I want to do engraving um, as well as cutting, then what I do is I change the color in Inkscape. So my text is a different color. I won't choose red because that is uh, difficult to see in the laser cutting software because it uses red for selection. So I've made my text blue and I've left my cut lines black. I can now go and do a save as, and I'm still going to keep it as a DXF file, but I'm going to not overwrite my original just out of habit. Um, and it's called plotter, desktop cutter plotter DXF. And that's in Inkscape. In yeah. So I've now got a DXF file on my disk, which I can take to the laser cutter and import into the Lightscribe software that our laser cutters run off. And it will bring in these colors automatically. So on the laser cutter software, I can select blue should be an engrave operation and black should be a cut operation. And it's ready to, uh, ready to go. Um, can I just ask if you're um, taking your files to a CNC machine, does SolidWorks enable you to create tool paths for particular? There cutters? is a product called SolidWorks CAM, which is yeah. for that purpose, but I've never used it. So I don't have any knowledge of how it operates or cooperates with the CNC um, route we've got in the woodworking room, for example, at Makespace. Works caps pretty grotty actually. You don't want to use that. Sorry? Uh, buy yourself a fusion license that gives you HSM works and you can hook that into solid works and uh, that's just brilliant. Sorry, I, I can't hear. Say that again. I said solid works cam, I haven't been able to get it to work. It's just totally grotty. Right. So what I've done is I've bought myself a Fusion 360 license. It comes with HSM Works, and HSM Works loads in SolidWorks, and it gives you everything you'll ever need. Can Can you write that in the chat so that I can, I I can take. So you said Fusion 360 and HSM Autodesk HSM Works. So F Fusion 360 is, is an AutoCAD. Mm. Okay. So I've not done any CNC myself, so I, I really can't kind of comment on um, the, the kind of the routes that work there. Um, what I will just briefly touch on, and we'll probably cover it in more detail another time. A um, couple of things. The first is that if I make further modifications to my, um, let's put another hole in. In fact, let's have a quick look at the hole wizard. So the hole wizard is a quick way of creating holes in my part. And you, you might think, well, why don't I just cut extrude circles to make holes? The advantage of the hole wizard is it's got a lot of built-in things such as different types of hole so, for example, if you want to do a countersunk screw hole, the countersink bit is built in. Or if you're doing a hole which doesn't go all the way through, then it will actually model the kind of shape of the drill end so that you get a kind of triangular bit at the bottom of the hole rather than a straight through hole. Um, it also, I often use just hole, um, but then I use the screw clearances mode, and that enables you to pick. Um, for the hole size automatically for the size of screws that you're going to put through the holes. So I'm assembling my laser cut piece with, with um, maybe M2.5 screws. I can just choose M2.5 here and I can say how loose or tight fitting I want that screw to be in the hole. So if I'm laser cutting and I want it to be really tight, I can go for close. If I'm 3D printing, my experience of 3D printers is that the holes tend to get a bit smaller than you model them. 
And I found that if you go for the loose screw size hole, they 3D print just about right for the screw to kind of fit nicely in the hole when it's 3D printed. So if I was going to 3D print this, make some holes for um, M2.5 screws, I would use screw clearances. If I want an exact two and a half millimeter hole, I would use drill sizes. And then you see it just asks you what size the drill is. I'll go for a two and a half millimeter drill. But if I 3D printed that, that hole wouldn't be big enough for a two, for a, the screw because the extrusion of the printer tends to make the hole a bit smaller. So I'm going to do drill sizes, uh, sorry, screw clearances, M2.5, loose. Then I go to the positions tab and I select the plane I want to drill through, which is going to be my top surface. And then you can see that I can just plunk down my holes wherever I want them. And when I tick the tick, you'll see if I open up this that I've got two sketches. One sketch is the holes, which are the, and you can see they're 3.1 millimeters in diameter because they're clearance holes for a two, M2.5. The other sketch is the position of the holes and it's just got the center points on. And you can see it's got a minus next to it because it's not fully constrained. So I can go in to edit that sketch and I can actually put my dimensions in. So I'm gonna say I want this hole to be, um, 15 millimeters from that edge. And I want it to be 40 millimeters from that edge. And then I'm going to say I want this hole to be vertically in line. So I've used the control key to do a selection of both items. And I'm going to put a vertical constraint. And then I'm going to go back into smart dimension and say, let's make that one. I notice I can do diagonal dimensions as well. So I could say, let's make that one 25 millimeters from that one and 25 millimeters from that one. Now it's not yet fully constrained. You can see it's still underdefined and I can see a couple of these are still blue. And if I try and drag them, we'll see what degrees of freedom they've got. Um, so what I need to do is actually say how far apart maybe I want these two. So let's add those and say put them 35 millimeters apart. It's now fully defined. So I can tick that, exit the sketch. And now I've got three holes in my piece. But the cool thing is that if I go back to my drawing, my holes have appeared in my drawing. So I can just export that as a DXF file and I'm straight into Inkscape ready to laser cut that with the holes. Yeah, the other workflow I might want to do is I might want to 3D print it. Maybe I'm stuck at home in lockdown and I can't get into MakeSpace to use the laser cutter, but I've got a 3D printer. And so I can instead go and do save as. Now, because I've got an assembly open, it's asking me, do I want to save this document with a new file name and update the assembly to the new file name? Or do I want to save it as a copy um, and leave the assembly pointing at the original file? Now, because I'm not wanting to create a, um, because I'm about to do a, a save as an STL file, um, I'm going to choose save as a copy. So it doesn't affect the original assembly. And then I just change the file type to STL. There are some advanced options if you want to kind of control how many triangles, but if you're just starting out, just keep the defaults and click save. And you'll see it's giving you a preview of what triangles it's created in order to define that shape in the STL file. I can say, yes, I'm happy with that. I've now got an STL file on my disk that I can take straight into my slicing software and do my uh, 3D printing slicing. So I'm gonna wrap up the, the kind of formal session there with the demo because we've uh, done just about an hour um, and open the floor to any questions or comments um, that anybody would like to ask at this One point. One of the interesting things about the hole wizard is that actually the sketch five that defines the screw hole shape is also something you can freely edit. So if you want irregular shaped holes that not necessarily are drillable, you can do those um, that way. And um, while they will not work on a cam machine, they'll work on a 3D printer. 
yeah, and that would also, of course, work on a laser cutter. So I could go in to edit my sketch there. Now notice the sketch plane of the hole is perpendicular to the plane of the, um, and it looks like it's actually doing the hole as a rotation around an axis. Yes, that's exactly what it does. It's a uh, rotating cut. Yeah. So you can change that measurement. You can see that the measurement is a fictitious measurement, meaning it's been drawn out to the backside, so it measures the double, double of the distance. And um, that way, if you change that to the actual hole diameter you need, um, that's what it's going to put out. Yeah, so I'll change that to five. My holes got bigger. Now I've got bigger holes. Yes, this is one thing that has to be mentioned. Uh, in one pass of the whole wizard, you can only set one type of hole, change one, change all. Mm. Melanie, um, I, I don't, sorry, I'm a computer novice. What, when you say one is to plug in with its own ribbon, uh, uh, at the oh. very top in SOLIDWORKS, these things that you see where features, sketch, etc., those are called ribbons. Oh, okay. So SOLIDWORKS, um, uh, or rather HSM works, adds another ribbon named CAM, which in my case, I've uh, turned off the SOLIDWORKS CAM because it's unusable. I've got a CAM there in, in place for the SOLIDWORKS CAM, and I can do my toolpaths from there in a toolpath design tree that lets me uh, do the cuts and base cuts on prior cuts and um, uh, uh, mill rather complex things. So if I bought an HSM Works license, I could work on, I could connect it to the SolidWorks. I and don't know actually if the HSM Works will connect to the student version. Okay. Make sure that you know about this uh, before you um, uh, do it to it, because yes. um, if it doesn't work with the student version, then uh, there is another product I don't remember it's just a light or something like that, something like that um, um that i believe does and it's free it just can't do as much but two and a half axes should be enough for most hobby and hobbyists so um uh, that uh, hsm express that's hsm express that's the free one okay cool uh right don't know a lot about the restrictions on the student versions because I'm a commercial user. So, okay. um, yeah. so to my knowledge, the main restriction in terms of features is that we don't have the toolbox. So SolidWorks has a feature called toolbox in the professional version, which has all of the kind of nuts, bolts, screws and fastenings and things that you might commonly want to use. Um, so apart from that and the uh, restriction on uh, non-commercial use only. It's for learning solid works rather than for um, and, and for hobby use, um, but but not for kind of commercial product development. Um, I, I, I don't believe there's any actual software restrictions in the capabilities. I believe there are. I believe the versions, uh, the saves from the educational versions, can be read by the commercials or vice versa. So that uh, the educational version can't be used to do the groundwork for commercial development that later gets machined. So, so the HSM you could specify particular cutters. Uh, yes, you have a tool crib that you need to define, and um, if you have a tool changer, you need to define the tool crib positions as well, and uh, you define your cutting head. There's a lot of uh, standard cutting heads mm. available. Yeah, yeah. Popular um, uh, uh, ER11. So, um, uh, yes, it works for small scale machines quite well. I've got a couple of small scale machines here and uh, it works. Okay. So, there's, there's an absolute ton of SolidWorks features we haven't looked at yet. Um, if you're planning to have a play with SolidWorks between now and the next session, um, some things you might want to look at are variations on the way of kind of duplicating features. So we looked at the linear pattern, but if you click the down arrow next to it, you'll see there's also circular patterns, mirrors, um, and then there's more complex ones. I've not actually used any of those others, 
but I use mirror and circular pattern quite a lot. Um, both of those need a geometric feature to kind of work with. So you need to probably add some reference geometry. Um, and I'll just show you an example of that. So I could add a plane. So if I wanted a plane that went down the middle of my piece of material, um, there's several ways to define a plane. But the easiest way I found for when it's going down the middle is to tack it onto these center lines of three edges. Now, in this case, for instance, I would have, touched, uh, would have um, uh, attached it to one face at one point. It would be parallel to the face and going to the point. Yeah, there, there's, there's lots of different ways of doing it. Um, three points or one face and, and a point. Um, once it says fully defined, I've now got a plane there which goes through the center of my part. And so I can now go and do a mirror and I can select, it's already selected the plane because I had it highlighted when I activated mirror, but if it isn't, you click in this box and select the plane. And then what feature do I want to mirror? I'll mirror my cut extrudes, but I want both of them to be mirrored. So I'm gonna mirror the pattern, which will pick both of them up. Now you can see it's reflected that feature and I've now got four holes. So that's one thing to play with. The other bit of reference geometry that's very useful is an axis. And if I create an axis through one of my screw holes by just selecting the hole, then I can now go and do a circular pattern around that axis. Um, and if I pick my screw holes there and say that I want six of them at 60 degree increments, you could see how that works. So two other ways of propagating features on your part, any that go off the part, just kind of, there's nothing for them to cut material out of. So they just kind of apparently disappear. But if I later made my part bigger, they are, they are there, except that I've defined my edge in such a way that that's not wide enough for it to appear. Okay. No, it's you defined it off the right edge. So. Uh, yeah, I, I, so this shows you why it's really important to define your constraints in the way you mount them. I defined this as 40 millimeters from the edge. Actually, probably what I really wanted to do was say that I want that to line up with the midpoint. easy way to select the middle point is to use shift instead of control you can use shift the context menu pops up keep holding shifts um, and um, uh, choose select midpoint so I, I select and then press shift now what i meant is once you hit the dot press shift then click the line with the right mouse button while holding shift you can get the option to select midpoint oh i picked the midpoint by No, that's not working for me. Right mouse, right mouse. And use, use oh, right mouse. Not control. Thank you. That's great. That's a that's a really useful tip that I will make a lot of use of. It also works with select other. Can I? I'm going to have to go. It, yeah. Is this going to be available on a YouTube channel? Did you uh, say? Yes, the Make Space YouTube channel will publish it um, in due course. So you'll be able to refer back and uh, hopefully it will all make perfect sense. And will that include our um, conversations with you, our questions, so that we can... Yes. They won't edit that out. And when is... When, only through the chat. When is the next session? Um, it's going to be the third Tuesday of every month. Cool. You'll find them on listed on Meetup. And if you want the chat, make a copy of it now, copy paste to a text or uh, edit. Yeah, document. the chat window won't be captured in the video. Uh... Has anybody got any burning questions before we wrap up the session? Um, Melanie, would you be 
can I ask, can I send you some questions about about CNC at some point? Are you I'm sure we could also have a call on any of the different platforms? Sorry? Yes, sure. If you can, we can also have a call on any of the given platforms. Oh, it, like the uh, the CAD, Zoom, the Google I Group. Mean, I meant, I meant that we can have a call on like Zoom or whereby or whatever. Okay. So if there's anything that um, I can help you with um, uh, outside of just uh, text, um, I can show you things and um, you know. That's also a great point, Kate. We do have a CAD Club Google Group. Um, I don't think hardly anything's been posted in it yet, but if you have questions, that's a place to post them and either myself or any other members of the club will hopefully um, be able to, to help you out. That would be great. And, and so if I, if I wanted to send Melanie a specific uh, CNC question, are you, is your name, is your contact details through this how do I reach you? You should be able to send private messages through Meetup to anyone who's signed up for the meeting. I don't know if that's limited to admins or to, um, and I think if you post in the Google group, your email address is displayed in the Google group. I've sent you a private with the email address. There you oh. go. Okay, through, through this, through the Zoom? No. No, that's a regular email address I put in the chat for you. Oh, cool. Oh, hang on. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. It's a steep learning curve for me. Yeah, it took me a while to get my head around <laughs> SolidWorks, and then once it all fell into place, I, I found that I, I was really flying with it very quickly. Um, but then there's just tons that you continue to learn. There's features I've not looked at still, um, and Melanie's given me three or four really useful tips tonight, which I will be using in my workflows going forwards, I'm sure. And that's the great thing about having a, a group session like this is that we all have kind of different ways we've learned to do things or we we kind of pick up different tips from each other. And I welcome that interaction. I look forward to many more sessions like this. I can show you a neat way to do these tabs for laser cutting. Mm -hmm. uh, use a linear sketch pattern, a couple of um, uh, construction lines. Uh, make them uh, move with the part, always be evenly spaced, always fit together. That's maybe something we can do in another session. Yes, yeah, or I, think... I, could, talk, I could show you. Paul, do you have the URL for the um, uh, the Google group? It might be useful to post uh, that. Yeah, let me yeah. put that in the chat. I was just looking at it for myself. Yeah, if, if questions are posted to the uh, the Google group, then everybody can benefit from both the question and the answer. Okay. And for it works, the answer tends to be a video. I've learned a huge amount of solid works from watching people's videos. There's some that are better than others, but it's uh, if you find a, a, a good um, a good video channel on YouTube of solid works experts, then there's some really good stuff out there. Okay, anything else anyone wants to ask me before I go and have a lie down? <laughs> no, that's great, thank you. Okay, I look forward to hearing, seeing your questions on the Google group and uh, to the next session in a month's time. Um, yes, thank you, thank you very much, Paul. Um, I've, I've just posted the uh, URL into the chat so everybody can see that. Yep. And, um, and so any email sent to that will everybody uh, signed up to it, we'll, we'll also get it. So thanks, thanks you, very much for tonight, Paul. Can, can you flag up when the when the YouTube video is available on the Google group? Uh, yes, we'll try to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Cool. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you. I will look forward to the next one.